Imagine suddenly having all your important files, photos, and documents locked up and held for ransom. Would it make you want to cry? In May 2017, a new piece of ransomware exploded into the world and swept across the internet, infecting hundreds of thousands of computers throughout 150 countries. The aptly named WannaCry didn't have a specific target, but it hit vulnerable systems and organizations hard. There was a long list of huge organizations affected by the WannaCry attack, including healthcare agencies, phone companies, and car companies. Let's dig into the details of this fascinating attack. Hey, I'm Rob Witcher. In this What the Hack video series, we explore some of the biggest cybersecurity breaches in modern history. If you find cybersecurity as fascinating as I do, then please subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notifications when we release new videos. Many doctors and healthcare professionals in the UK on the 12th of May 2017 turned on their computers and were met with a red box. Oops, your files have been encrypted, the message read. It went on to explain that users couldn't access their files or use their computers until a ransom had been paid. One day was all it took. WannaCry has infected more than 230,000 computers in over 150 countries across the globe in a single day. Ransomware is a type of malware that infects computers and then encrypts all the data stored on the computer. And without the right key to decrypt the data, it's now all totally inaccessible, essentially deleted. For what purpose? Well, you probably guessed it. To hold your data for ransom. The hackers promise to provide the decryption key so you can unlock your data, provided you pay them a ransom fee, of course. In the case of WannaCry, the attackers asked for 0.1 Bitcoin, around $300 at the time, and gave the user three days to pay the fee. After three days, the fee doubled for another three days. After that point, it was too late, your data was gone. A lot of people question, will I get my data back if I pay the ransom? It honestly depends on the attackers and what they decide to do. But here's what I would suggest. This is a business. And like any other business, the attackers want to get paid and make sure they keep getting paid. If it becomes well known that you will never get your data back, no one is going to pay. That's bad business. So most of the time, people and organizations will usually get their data back if they pay. Now, I'm certainly not advocating that you should pay if you've had a ransomware attack, as that just perpetuates this whole massive ransomware problem. But I'm, I'm getting off track here. Let's go back to the WannaCry, and I'll talk about how best to deal with ransomware at the end. Within a day of its release, the super virulent WannaCry worm had infected over 200,000 devices globally. Systems running Windows XP were particularly vulnerable as no current patch was available at the time to protect them. Rather shamefully, the vast majority of the infected devices were running Windows 7, and they were vulnerable and infected because they were missing the appropriate security patches. Organizations were most at risk because of WannaCry's ability to spread easily and rapidly through local networks. This made an organization like the NHS, the National Health Services in Britain, particularly vulnerable. The NHS was one of the worst affected organizations around the globe. About a third of the NHS network was affected by WannaCry. Hospitals had to cancel almost 20,000 appointments, including operations, and some ambulances even had to be diverted to different hospitals. Car companies like Nissan and Renault were hit and stopped production in some other facilities. Phone companies like Spain's Telefonica were hit, as well as FedEx and many other big companies. It became apparent that this malware attack was one of the biggest and fastest spreading that the world had ever seen to date. And people were wondering how anyone was going to get a handle on this and stop its rapid spread. In a bedroom in remote western England, a young man sat at his computer. Though he didn't know it, Marcus Hutchins was about to do something that would not only have a global impact, but would change the course of his life. He'd been interested in computers and coding since a young age, and was working in cybersecurity at the time. When the news broke about WannaCry, he started to examine the code. He discovered a URL in the code for a domain that was unregistered. This is the crazy domain here. I, I'm not going to bore you with laboriously reading the entire thing out, but it's a long, interesting domain. Marcus decided to quickly register the domain himself. And right after that, the infection rate of WannaCry suddenly and rapidly started to drop globally. It was discovered that this domain was a kill switch. We'll delve into that more later on, but it's likely the hackers who made WannaCry built this in as a feature, as a kill switch, so that they could stop the worm from spreading if and when they wanted to. Marcus had accidentally hit the kill switch. His identity was leaked by tabloid press, and Marcus suddenly had reporters turning up at his parents' house where he lived. His quiet life was turned upside down, and he was hailed as a hero. The story of this gangly young fellow who'd single-handedly stopped the spread of this global malware disaster was irresistible. Despite wanting to remain private and not thinking of himself as a hero, when he was invited to the famous DEF CON convention in Las Vegas that August, he couldn't say no. And that's when the FBI caught up to him. Malware... Marcus had helped code in his youth as a teen in rural England, 
had caught the attention of the feds, and his connection with well-known hackers was of huge interest to them. Registering the domain name that had stopped WannaCry had led to a lot of unwanted attention for Marcus, and ultimately his arrest in the US. WannaCry didn't end up causing huge long-term damage, but it cost companies like the NHS a lot of money. The UK's Department of Health and Social Care estimated that the cleanup of the incident cost the NHS over $100 million. There was even speculation as to whether the attack and subsequent ambulance diversions may have cost more people their lives. At least one study believed there could have been an uptick in deaths because of the WannaCry attack. But data is hard to pry out of the hands of the hospitals, so we may never know. It was estimated that WannaCry caused a total of $4 billion in losses around the world. By June of 2017, when the WannaCry attack had subsided, the attackers had only made around $130,000 from the attack. Save for Marcus and his timely domain name registration, things could have been much, much worse. The potential was there for a much more catastrophic outcome. If, for example, the ransomware had targeted more specific networks for something like transportation systems or nuclear facilities, there's no telling what kind of disaster could have occurred. How did the hackers and WannaCrys create such widespread chaos? Weirdly, the whole thing started with the National Security Agency, the NSA. They'd created a tool that exploited a weakness in Microsoft software, the Windows Server Message Block SMB protocol. The NSA discovered that the SMB protocol, which is a system for sharing files across a network, can be tricked into accepting data packets from outside attackers. Eternal Blue was the name given to the exploit created by the NSA, and their exploit was designed to use that flaw to gain access into networks. In April of 2017, the hacker group Shadow Brokers leaked Eternal Blue to the world. There was a patch released by Microsoft in April 2017 to rectify the situation now that Eternal Blue had been leaked which should have fixed the issue and avoided an attack, just like WannaCry. Except that, predictably, not everyone downloaded and installed the update when their system popped up a message telling them that the updates were available. Let's admit it, we've all uh, hit the ignore or remind me tomorrow on an update. They can definitely be annoying sometimes. Another big problem was that many of the organizations were running the outdated Windows XP operating system on some of their systems, and Microsoft had stopped releasing security updates for it. This left a huge number of systems vulnerable, which gave WannaCry the opportunity to use the Eternal Blue exploit to carry out such a large-scale attack. While initially it was thought that WannaCry started with email phishing, it's more likely that the initial affection was through a vulnerable SNB port somewhere in Asia. WannaCry is able to spread rapidly by including transport code, which scans for vulnerable systems and then automatically spreads itself. Once WannaCry discovers a vulnerable system and starts to get in, it uses Double Pulsar, a backdoor tool to install and execute a copy of itself on the infected machines. Double Pulsar was also released by the Shadow Brokers in April of 2017. When the WannaCry malware is executed, it first checks the kill switch domain to see if it's registered. If the domain hasn't been registered, then the ransomware encrypts the data on the devices or on the system, and then looks to exploit the SMB vulnerability on other systems and therefore spread itself across the network. This is how WannaCry was able to spread so rapidly around the world. Once it infected one system, that would find multiple others. Once they were infected, they would find multiple other systems. It was growing exponentially. Once Marcus had registered the domain though, the WannaCry ransomware would stop encrypting systems and stopped looking for new systems to infect. This is a message that needs to be hammered home time and time again. It's incredibly important to back up critical data and store it offline. This way, if hackers do get in, you can restore your data after cleaning up the infected devices. The NHS luckily had backups of everything important, which was why this incident didn't cause long-term disaster for the hospitals it affected, as they were able to get back up and running relatively quickly. It might be annoying, but WannaCry really showcases how important it is to install updates. It's vitally important to keep operating systems and software up to date. This goes for both individuals and organizations. Alongside this, using obsolete hardware or software that doesn't have vendor support is really asking for trouble. Enabling automatic updates is also a good idea wherever possible, especially when it comes to devices connected to a network, in particular the internet. Not to keep picking on NHS here, but they are a good example here. The NHS was fairly slow to react in a coherent way to the WannaCry attack. People in the NHS who found their systems infected didn't know who to report the attack to. Communications and leadership on the issue were lacking in the early stages of the attack. The NHS identified multiple lessons to be learned from this attack, including setting out a response plan in the event that something like this might happen again, and establishing roles and responsibilities of local and national NHS bodies. WannaCry was an unprecedented attack in scope and scale, and its potential to cause chaos in vital organizations. It highlighted the vulnerability of using old or outdated systems, and the incredible importance of keeping systems up to date with patches. It gave us all just a taste of the potential for a crypto worm cyber attack to wreak havoc on healthcare and other large organizations. 
It left many people a little on edge, as there's no way of knowing what the next cyber attack might be capable of or what it might target. If you found this video interesting and informative, then please hit the thumbs up button so we know you like this type of content. And let us know in the comments below what breaches you want us to cover in the future. See you in the next one.